Well, good morning. We're going to commence our service together. We're turning to the Psalm 65, and we'll sing verses 1 through to 4. Praise waits for thee in Zion, Lord. To thee vows paid shall be, O thou that hear art of prayer. All flesh shall come to thee. Psalm 65, verses 1 through to 4. Let's stand together as we worship, please. seek the face of the Lord. Merciful God and loving Heavenly Father, we come by faith again into thy thrice holy presence. We do so in the lovely and adorable name of Jesus Christ, Thine only begotten Son, our blessed Lord and Redeemer. And how we're thrilled that we read in the Scriptures, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And we thank Thee today for Christ Jesus our Lord. We're conscious that we have many things to give Thee thanks for. We raise the testimony like David Speaking of thee daily, he loadeth me with benefits. And we bless thee, O God, in the knowledge that thou art our creator and maker. We're thrilled that we read in the book, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We acknowledge that out of nothing, in the space of six 24-hour days, thou didst speak into being all that is. And thou didst declare all that thou had created throughout the whole of the universe, worlds upon worlds, thou did declare it very good. We acknowledge in the sixth day thou did make man in thine own image. Thou did take the dust of the ground, form a human body, breathe into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And Lord, we're conscious that we're totally dependent on thee. We're accountable to thee. 
Oh God, for in thee we move and live in a being. And we thank thee for the very precious gift of life. We thank you for the gift of health and strength. We thank you for every blessing, physical, material, emotional, temporal, mental, aye, and spiritual blessings that's ours in Christ also. We're thankful today in the knowledge that thou art absolutely sovereign over the world that thou hast made. Thou art an absolute sovereign control. We say like the psalmist, the Lord God of Nepeteth reigneth. We're, we're conscious, Lord, that thou art he that is foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. And none stayest thy hand, none sayest to thy what doest thou. And all thou dost is good and for thy glory. And like Nahum we exclaim, the Lord is good. We thank thee that thou art thrice holy, that thou dost dwell in light unapproachable. And even again this day the seraphims and cherubims cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We confess we have little cognizance of what a holy and just God thou art. But oh, thou art thrice holy. Help us, Lord, to understand. We worship thee today as a God who is just and righteous. We thank thee that with thee is plenteous redemption. We rejoice in the knowledge that thou art the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who planned the great plan of redemption. Thank thee for sending thy Son into the world to accomplish that redemption. We thank thee for the person and work of Christ. We thank thee for that redemptive work applied to us through the instrumentality of thy Spirit and all that Jesus Christ procured for us in his person and work especially in his blood shedding on Mount Calvary. We're glad, Lord, through the work of thy spirit, the reality of that work is put to our account. And Lord, we're found this day again, not only in the house of God, but many of us are found in Christ. And we can sing, dear Savior, thou art mine. We rejoice that thou art not only Redeemer, but thou art Savior, thou art friend, thou art the shepherd and bishop of our soul. And we bring ourselves afresh before thee now. We ask for fresh cleansing in the blood. We pray for a fresh quickening. We ask thee to open our ears and open our eyes of understanding. And Lord, help us not only to see thee with the eye of faith, but help us to hear thy voice and help us to meet with thee at this time. We need thee. We want thee. We recognize that thou art one of our number. Make thy presence a glorious felt reality as we wait in thy presence, as we attempt to draw near to worship thee in the beauty of thy holiness. Is it not written, God is a spirit? And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. O oh Lord, remember us now as we draw nigh before thee. Thou hast said, draw nigh to God. And thou hast given us the sure promise, he will draw nigh to thee. And we want the conscious sense of thy presence now, even as we seek to uh, worship thee at this time. Cleanse us in the blood to this end. Quicken us by the Holy Spirit. Shut us in with thyself. Reveal to us thy lovely Son. Help us to come to his cross. Help us to stand there. Help us to see him as Savior today. Sin bearer, sacrifice, substitute, the sin offering. And help us to bow our heads and say, Thank you, Lord. Hear prayer at this time. Lord, remember us now. Undertake for us. We commend the whole of the service to thee, the continual praise, the offering of prayer, the offering of gifts, the reading of the scriptures, the children's address. We leave it all before thee. And we pray for thy help and thy blessing now. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's further worship the Lord. We're going to turn to the uh, lovely hymn, uh, hymn 215. 215. Stand together as we sing. 215.
Now let's turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to read again from verse 8 right through to verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Let's hear the word of God. Reading, of course, from the authorized version. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In him also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 15. And we pray the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of his own precious and infallible word. Now, for a few minutes, we're going to continue with our short series of messages, what I've entitled The Gospel in the Farmyard. And we've been looking at a number of animals, and we've been looking at a number of farmyard um, pieces of machinery. Now, I've got something with me here in the bag, and we'll bring it out. Um, this is a particular creature that's found in every farmyard in Northern Ireland. Okay. This is called Molly the Mouse. Molly the Mouse is from Acton. She's only got one eye, so she's been in the wars. We'll have to get her sewed up again. And I've also got another mouse with me. What do we see? This is Michael the Mouse. Michael the Mouse come all the way from the land of Israel. See how quickly he goes, look. Well, he can fairly go. We'll set Michael there beside Molly. If he doesn't run away. Look. There we go. I thought maybe we would have had many of the mice and she's all the way from the United States of America. Now, I want you to think of this. The other day... Maybe it was a few weeks ago. I was down at Ferndale and I was coming in through the parlor door and one of the cats run past me and I happened to notice the cat had a lovely big juicy mouse in its mouth. And that got me thinking. You see, the word mouse is mentioned in the Bible. It's, in fact, it's mentioned twice. And the word mice is mentioned four times and that gives us a total of six references. But I want you to think, young people, of the picture of the mouse because it's a picture of sin. Do you know that there's two kinds of animals in the Bible, clean and unclean? And the mouse is pictured as an unclean animal. You see, it's a picture of sin in its moral uncleanness. And why did God give us clean animals and unclean animals, mention it specifically in the Bible? Well, it was to remind the children of Israel of the difference between a holy life and a sinful life. And every time they saw an unclean animal, like the mouse, whether it was Molly the mouse or Michael the mouse or Minnie the mouse, that was a picture and reminder of them of their sin and of their sinful nature. Listen to what the Bible says. Here's the first reference to mice, Leviticus 11, 29. These also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth. The weasel, so if you see a weasel, it's an unclean animal, remind you of your sin. Or the mouse, again, an unclean animal. 
and the tortoise after his kind. So if you've got a tortoise in your house, that's an unclean animal, and that's a reminder of you of your own sinful nature. But I want you to think of this. The particulars of the mouse. Now, I'm indebted to Dr. Frank McClellan for this because he mentioned this in the book, Eagle Wings. Some animals are found in only certain parts of the world. The donkey, the cow, the pig, the hen, the, the duck. But the mouse is found in every country in the world. Michael the mouse, the land of Israel, special present from a particular minister to uh, my wife, Molly the mouse from Acton, and of course many of the mouses in the United States of America. But in every country of the world, you see, sin is universal. For all of sin, the Bible tells us, and comes short of the glory of God. Now, I'll tell you something else about the mouse. It's a, it's a wee sneaky animal. Remember Robert Burns wrote the poem in 1785 when he was plowing with the plow in the field and he disturbed a mouse nest uh, and he, he called it a wee, sleeked, cowering, timory, beastie of a creature. And, and the word sleeked, it's, it's, it's Scots-Irish, isn't it? And it means sneaky. And what does the mouse do? Well, it darts here and there. And it gets into your house through the tiniest of openings. It's not just like sin. In the tiniest opening of the door to sin, sin comes in to invade, sin comes in to stay. And I'll tell you something else about the mouse. It can breed rapidly. Do you know one pair, if we think of Molly and Michael here, and if they have plenty of water and plenty of food, in one year, how many mice can they breed between them? Here's the answer. Three to four hundred. That's why the mouse, of course, is sought after by the cat, because the cat is keeping the mice population down, and that's true of Ferndale and true of other farms. But I want to tell you, sin breeds rapidly. Remember King David on the rooftop? Just a look of lust upon a woman. And what did it lead to? It led to adultery. It led to lying. It led to murder. It led to trouble in his home. I'll tell you something else about the mice. They're very destructive. They can do a lot of damage. And doesn't sin do damage? Isn't sin very destructive? I'll tell you something else, Dr. Frank McClellan suggested. Mice are attractive. Are you attracted to mice? I know a woman, and whenever Michael the mouse came round her feet, she was squealing, and it was heard in the Golhan Heights right down to Jerusalem. And I wouldn't like to repeat the squeal because it would be ear piercing. But listen to me carefully. Despite that, some people think mice are attractive, and they have white mice in their home. Someone said sin fascinates. It doesn't fascinate young people. But then it adds sin also assassinates. So that's the particulars of the mice. Sin is universal. They're sneaky. They breed rapidly. And they're very attractive. Let me think about the purging of the mice. If they're not dealt with, they can overrun a home. They can overrun a farm. They could even overrun a big country like Australia. And it's not so long ago they had an infestation of mice. And of course, that's why you need the cat. And it's good at catching the mouse. But I was thinking about a picture of sin. Our sin needs to be dealt with. Sin that's universal. Sin that breeds rabbit. Sin that's attractive. Sin that's sneaky. It has to be dealt with. How is it dealt with? Well, here's only one answer. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And the next time you see a mouse, you remind her, that's a picture of my sin. And like the mouse, this sin is, needs to be dealt with. And it only can be dealt with through the ground of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. So there's another animal from the farmyard. Next week, in the will of God, We hope to do the tractor. We'll go back to the red tractor. I haven't forgot about it, but we'll go back to the red tractor. Okay? 
Just a few quick announcements. We do welcome all of you in the Lord's name. We thank you for coming. At 6.30, we'll meet for prayer. And also at 7 o'clock, then we'll have the evening service. And I'm going to attempt to preach on the subject that I've entitled, Lessons from the Power of the Grave. Wednesday night, the prayer and Bible study meeting will take the format of the annual report. Some of you missed it last week. So come this week and join with us and our brother William will tell you how much money came in, how much money we spent and how much money we have left. Now on Friday night, it's a very important night in the life and witness of the church because we're having a congregational meeting to approve the uh, constitutional documents as approved by Presbytery. That meeting will be at eight o'clock and would we'll ask you to do your best to attend uh, for the short time that it is on. Next Lord's Day, just the usual services at 10.30 Sunday school, morning and evening worship, 11.30 and 7, preceded by the times of prayer. Next Sunday night, we'll take the uh, format of a family night, and Mr. Colin Hupps here will be testifying and bringing us some ministry and song. Also, we'll have the presentation of the uh, Queen's Platinum Jubilee Bibles and the various books that we have purchased for the children and for the young people. In relation to that congregational meeting that I mentioned, could I just bring to your attention that if you think about communicant membership or have thought about it and are interested, then we, we recommend that to you. Please come and speak to us. Uh, we would like at some stage in the future to have fresh elections to uh, offices that are open in the church, and we would ask that you pray about that as uh, it's open to all communicant members. And if you want to become a communicant member, then please come and speak to me. Also, maybe I should have mentioned quickly about baptism. That's a very important subject. If you want to think about baptism, uh, then please come and speak to me, and we can arrange that with the Reverend Martin and others in due time. I also want to thank the individual that gave me the gift for 500 pounds. She knows who she is the gift for 250 pounds and the gift for 10 pounds, three very precious ladies, and we thank you for your giving to the work of God. We also want to announce that we have sent 1,000 pounds to the Ukraine appeal to the mission board, and hopefully the food stuff will be uh, distributed down to Balamone by the end of this incoming week. Um, there's two other things that I want to announce. On Wednesday, the 1st of June, we're going to have a, a children's party here, and we appreciate your cooperation and help, and we look forward to the children gathering as part of our Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. That's Wednesday, the 1st of June. That's Wednesday week, and the prayer meeting and the Bible study will be in here um, on that occasion. Uh, and also then on Friday, the 3rd of June, uh, Rosemary and I are hosting a Queen's Platinum Jubilee afternoon tea. The time is at 2 p.m. Now, this is for the more senior people of the church, the grannies, the mummies, the aunties, the uncles, and, and you who uh, accompany them. You're, you're welcome to come with your mummy, your granny, your auntie, your uncle. All right? So um, what we'd like you to do today or during the week, uh, write down the names on a sheet of paper that will be provided and give us a rough estimate for catering uh, purposes. So we're, we're looking roughly to have about 70 people in the Luther Hall, and uh, I'll be sending out some text uh, messages uh, later on in the week. So do remember that. And then Sunday week then, uh, no, 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 not Sunday, Sunday fortnight, uh, I'll be preaching then on the Queen's Platinum Jubilee uh, celebration. So do remember that uh, very much in prayer. And could I just uh, thank those who are waiting patiently for me coming to uh, see them in a pastoral way as a number of people, and I'll be with you this week. Uh, things have uh, uh, been busy this past fortnight, but we're, we're thankful to the Lord. Uh, things have been sorted out and resolved. So uh, I'll be able to come and see you this week uh, in the will of God. These are all the announcements that are subject to the will of the Lord. We'll turn to the hymn 208. Apologies for the lengthy announcements, but we have to get through them as best we can. Hymn number 208, Sound the Gospel of Grace Abroad. There's life in the risen Lord. We'll remain seated for verses 1 and 2, and then we'll stand for verses 3 and 4 after the offering has been received.
Let's stand for verses 3 and 4. Let's just have a wee prayer together. Merciful God, as we wait on in thy presence, we thank thee in Jesus' name for the gifts and tithes and offerings for the work of God. We know that little is much when God is in it. And we thank you, Lord, for the giving to the general fund and to the building fund, even of the work of the church. We bless thee, O God, for the sacrifice, the voluntary giving of thy people. And we pray that you'll bless them in their heart and in their soul. We look to thee that you'll remember those that are ill at this time, those that have just been in and out of hospital. We think of Marianne, we think of James. We ask you, Lord, even to bless Sylvia today with every ache and pain. Do the same for Georgie. Lord, you know the time that she spent in the hospital this week, the tests that are ongoing. And we commend her to thy grace and pray for the help of God. Pray for the healing touch of her brother James. And you'll minister to him all that ails him at this time. Bless Bobby and Sadie. 
Lord, undertake for them. We think of Wilger today. We think of Stanley Cook. We, we pray you'll remember Rita. We ask thee, Lord, to bless Hartford and Phyllis and all their heartache and sorrow. Rita as well. We know that she's only one of many that's been bereft of a loved one. And we pray for the help of God. Bless and strengthen Gareth and his family at this time. Minister to them and meet their need. And we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name also that thou will visit us with household salvation. We pray, Lord, that thou will bless even in a way that uh, young people will be converted, those that are cold and backslidden will be restored, and the church and the work of God will be strengthened. Send us new families, add to us. Bless those on holiday today. Remember them, whether in Cyprus or in England, be with them. You know who they are, all about them. Even bless Joanna in Miami and keep your hand upon her. Lord, have mercy now as we wait on in thy presence. Bless our queen today. We thank you for her and our celebrations as we're coming up to the Queen's Platinum Jubilee time. Lord, help Help us, we pray. Remember our land and its needs. Send a glorious help sent revival of true Bible believing religion to Northern Ireland. Just be with us now as we turn to thy precious word. You've heard us singing, be offering of praise. We ask thee now to bless thy word to our understanding. Let thy word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Speak to us out of the book, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now this morning, as we continue with our series of expository sermons in the book of Colossians, my text today is Colossians chapter 2 and the verse 14. And I've entitled the theme as this, the only scriptural basis on which God pardons sin. Now remember the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to a New Testament congregation located at a place called Colossae. Colossae is in Asia Minor. He's addressing a sea of people. These people were mostly Gentile people. That's non-Jews. I have no doubt there was a few Jews among them. But this congregation, by and large, was formed out of a people converted from a pagan background. So prior to their conversion, they had no real knowledge of God. They had no in-depth knowledge of the Word of God. They had no real depth knowledge of the personal work of Jesus Christ in all his fullness. And not long after the conversion to Christ and the church was founded, a great danger arose. It threatened the very life and existence of this newly formed New Testament church. What was it? It was the arrival of false teachers with their false teaching. And this false teaching threatened to destroy this infant church. It was a very subtle attack along three lines. There was a Jewish aspect. Certain Judaizers arose up among the people and insisted that these Gentiles converts were uh, physically circumcised. Uh, the, the aspect was about the place of the law in the life of a true believer. And they argued that they had to undergo the ceremonial and civil aspects of that law. There was also then what we call a Gnostic aspect. Uh, you need a special wisdom that only this particular group uh, could impart. Uh, and um, you uh, had to withdraw from any that didn't have that special wisdom. And then there was a mystical aspect. Uh, you need the help of angels in the unseen spirit world. They, they're to act as intermediaries between us and between God. Then the face of such a dangerous threat, the pastor Ephesus, uh, Epaphras, he was a convert of the apostle Paul, set off for Rome a thousand miles away to seek Paul's help. So the apostle Paul, after being told the problem in Colossae, wrote this wonderful letter. Now he wrote it, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he wrote it to encourage God's people. And how did he deal with the error, this threefold error, this Jewish aspect, this Gnostic aspect, and this mystical aspect inside this church? Well, he did so by setting forth the personal work of Christ. He was stressing the need to each and every believer, you must master the truth about the person of Christ. You see, the right, the best, the only way to repel error is to set forth the true scriptural teaching of the person and work of Christ. And you see, as you come here each Lord's Day, come during the midweek service and we open the book, I'm not attempting to give you a, a theological lecture. I'm not attempting to give you a, a history lesson. I'm not even going about to uh, use uh, what we talk about comparative religion, set one side by side uh, and one against the other to try and ascertain the truth. I'm not saying there's not a place for this. No, each Lord's Day, I've been attempting to set before you 
a good and better understanding of the good news of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, some in Colossae had a wrong view of the person of Christ, and Apostle Paul dealt with that. But many in Colossae had a wrong view of the work of Christ. They were insisting the mediation of angels. They were insisting on, on, on um, uh, physical circumcision. They, they, they were insisting on, on, on law works and special wisdom. And here in Colossians 2.13, we notice how uh, the Apostle Paul was trying to encourage and help the people of God by saying, you don't need physical circumcision. Remember, you're alive. Remember, you've already been forgiven, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now, here's the question. How is this possible? On what ground is it given? How can this happen? You see, the living and true God doesn't ignore sin. He doesn't sweep it under the carpet. He doesn't pretend it doesn't matter. He doesn't just pronounce a pardon. Oh, I have forgiven you. No, no. How did he deal with sin? Look at verse 14. Listen to the text. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, what can we learn? You see, how does God deal with sin? Well, it has to do with the work of Christ and the cross. The work of Christ and the cross is the only scriptural basis in which God pardons sin. So God's forgiveness is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Outside of Jesus Christ, apart from Jesus Christ, there's no true forgiveness of sins. It's not the church pronouncing a pardon for sins. It is Christ. And here's the question facing you and me today. It's this. Are our sins forgiven through the work of Christ's cross? All our sins of thought and word and deed. How are they pardoned? Here's the answer. The only scriptural basis in which God pardons sins is the work of Christ's cross. That's according to Colossians 2 verse 14. Now three things this morning. I want you to think first of all of a discussion about trespasses. Notice the last word of verse 13. Having forgiven you all trespasses. What is a trespass? You see a sign, trespassers prosecuted. Or do not trespass. The word trespass means breaking the law. It, it, it ties into the fact that sin is a transgression of the law. Now, let me illustrate. You've heard of a ship called Bounty. It's from the famous film, Mutiny on the Bounty. Think of a crew taking over the ship. The captain and a few officers who haven't been killed are set adrift in a small boat to uh, come to some particular island. The men left on board, they're known as mutineers. Hence the title of the film, Mutiny on the Bounty. Now, they're guilty of breaking the law. They're guilty of a trespass. They're guilty of treason. They're guilty of rebellion. And they're only young men. Now, this particular sin, this particular transgression, left them all guilty of the same act. Now, suppose some of these young men in later times, 10, 15 years later, made it home to England. The ship was sold. They reformed their life. Some became model citizens. Maybe some became a hero to their country. Maybe they gave money to the poor. Maybe they married into high society. They mixed in higher circles. Maybe some of them fell in love with a gentleman's daughter. And they're married now. And they live in a big house. And they've got a family. And they've got children. And they're classified as part of the nobility. And they wear nice clothes. I want to tell you, you've got the picture now. What are they? Before God in the eyes of men... They're still a mutineer in the eyes of the law. They're still guilty of high treason on the high sea. They're still guilty of rebellion to their captain. You see, in the eyes of the law, they have committed a trespass. And nothing can wipe it out. Nothing can deal with that. They're still guilty. And of course, they've added to that guilt by additional guilt. And uh, that... Uh, Guilt has to do with their thoughts and their words and their deeds. 
And of course, they've added to that additional guilt by because they've got a polluted heart and they've got a stack of trespasses. Notice it's in the plural. And it's all rising up against them, almost like a great mountain of debt. Guilt because of thoughts and words and deeds. And you know, that's the state of every one of us before God. We are guilty of high treason to God and his law. High treason and rebellion against God's throne and God's government. And it's important to you to remember and realize your true state before God. You are guilty and I'm guilty of trespassing against God and his law. Trespasses in thought, in word and deed. And the greatest need is to experience a spiritual awakening. A spiritual resurrection. The greatest need is the infusion of new life. And a full free pardon. Isn't this what the psalmist said in Psalm 32? Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And the new spirit, there is no guile. Your sins, that the Bible calls transpasses, is carried away, covered over cancelled out in a legal sense the penalty of sin is dealt with wages of sin is death the bible says romans 6 and 23 the power of sin is broken your the pleasure of sin is spoiled you know hate and low sin you you turn from it to god and you long to be saved from its very presence you see the apostle paul at the end of 13 makes a wonderful absolute statement having forgiven you all trespasses hi god just doesn't say i have forgiven you you know there there's a basis for it there, there's a ground upon which he does it there's a foundation for true forgiveness and that's what's dealt with in verse 14 so there's a discussion about trespasses notice also secondly the documentation of trespasses. Now we're going to look at verse 14. Listen to these words. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to you. So let's think of that phrase. The handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. So let's identify the document here. The documentation of trespasses. Where is it found? In the handwriting of of ordinances. Now, what does Paul mean? I already understand this. But what does this phrase mean? I have to confess, this has bothered me for a long time. I've, in my mind, struggled with what that actually meant. Now, I didn't consult the English dictionary, neither the Collins or the Oxford. I wanted to let the Bible speak. The handwriting of ordinances. What does it mean? Well, it refers, and listen to me carefully, to a document written for the purpose of condemning sinners. We're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But our sins of thought and word and deed is contained in a document. Think of a document that contains all our trespasses. Every one of our thoughts and words and deeds. You see, the word ordinances in the Greek means a dogma. A dogma is a principle of belief. A dogma is a law. A dogma is a standard of practice. A dogma is a, is a code. It's a foremost statement. You've got to think of a document that contains a lawful, and legal standard that is written that contains and is a record of all our transgressions. Now notice that that's against us. Notice that it's contrary to us. We'll get to that in a wee minute. What does that mean? If there is a document that's written for the purpose of condemning sinners... A document that contains all our trespasses, 
of thought and word and deed, a, a, a document that is a standard, a document that is a law and a code that can be referred to, that can be pointed to, and that's against us, and it's contrary to us, then that means that we're in real trouble with God. I referred to this last Sabbath evening, Job chapter 13 and verse 23. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgressions and my sins. Oh, that that would be a prayer of the Ulster people. This handwriting of ordinances is in reality a reference to the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. And it's summarized in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. So when you think of this, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, Paul was thinking about the moral law of God. He was thinking about the writing of the two tables of stone written by the finger of God, which summarizes for us the Ten Commandments. That's a legal document. It's a moral document. It's authoritative. It's a permanent document. It's a document that's universally binding. And it's against you and me. It's contrary to us. It hasn't been repealed. It hasn't been thrown out of the way. It's a document that's legally binding. Oh, that we could see this morning. There's a law that's against us. A law that has authority over us. A law that's legally binding. A law that promises us pronounces us guilty, a a, a law that, that is there as a witness because in the handwriting of ordinances it can be turned up every trespass that's contrary to that law in thought, in word and deed. You see, we could choose to ignore the law. You could say, well, the law means nothing to me. You could say, well, I don't believe in the Ten Commandments. Still makes no difference. You and I are subject to that law. Now, let me try and prove that. You, you could ignore the law of the land. Traffic laws, run the red light, drive in ball tires for a time, use your mobile phone when you're not supposed to, refuse to wear a seatbelt. You could say, I'm not going to tax my car. I'm not going to insure my car. What will happen eventually? Oh, oh you'll get stopped by the police. You'll be caught on the camera. You can ignore it. You can say it's nothing to me, but you're still subject to it. And if the police get the hold of you, then you're in big trouble with the law and you'll suffer the consequences if they catch you. You see, you're subject to it whether you like it or not. You can disregard it. You can reject it. You can denounce it. You can protest. You can say it's nothing to me, but you're still subject to it. It's still against you. It's still contrary to you. But you, you see, people say to me today, but the, the Ten Commandments, they're outdated. Nobody believes in that stuff anymore. It's not relevant to me. It doesn't apply to me. It's only used by the church to control people. Surely I couldn't be subject to it. You are. So am I. You know, all men universally are subject to it without exception. Turn over there to Romans chapter 3 and look with me at verse 19. The Apostle Paul is summing up his argument. He's already sought to prove the universality of sin, the universality of guilt, the universality of men transgressing and trespassing the law of God. And he says this by way of summary. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, It's safe to them who are under the law. It's not just a few Jews, and it's not just a few Gentiles. How do we know that? That every mouth may be stopped. And notice this, and all the world may become guilty before God. How could all the world become guilty before God? The answer is they're subject to the law of God. They're under that law. They're they're accountable to it. 
and we're accountable for every idle word, every wrong sinful deed, and every impure, godless, wicked thought that comes into your mind. You see, the law has a binding authority over us. If we go back to the word ordinances there, the handwriting of ordinances, remember I said the word ordinances means a dogma, and God is being dogmatic when it comes to his ordinances. You've got to think of all the laws of God. And the moral law and the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17, it's just a summary of that law. And it's all authoritative. It's all legally binding. It's all permanent. And the fullest treatment of that law is contained in the Scriptures. And that moral law reflects the the character of God. We're not talking about the ceremonial law or the civil law. There's aspects that reflect that moral law, but but they're not legally binding. But the moral law of God is. Take, for example, this, the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do we love anyone or anything as much as or more than God? Can we say I love the living and the true God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength 24-7? Can we say that I love the Lord Jesus Christ more than anyone or anything in the whole wide world. The reality is we don't have that ability. Natural man doesn't love God first. Natural man doesn't love God at the center. We don't love God by nature. No, no, we're inventor of false gods in our heads and in our hearts. We, we create objects of our own devotion. We're inventors of idolatry. And people might say, but that's unfair to say that. People might argue, but but that's not right. But you see, this living and true God provides for our well-being. He's the God in whose hand their very breath is. Our chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And the very fact that we don't glorify God in all our thoughts, words, and deeds, and enjoy him in the fullness of his revelation, then we're guilty of breaking the first commandment. What about the second? Guilty of idolatry, invention of false gods, think about false religion, think about false cults, worshipping the sun, moon, the stars, worshipping the creature more than the creator. The third commandment, taking the name of the Lord in vain, using God's name as a swear word, using God's name in blasphemy, in inciting God when, when we're, we're, we're behaving wrongly and badly. Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. See, the Sabbath day is not kept the way it should be. People doing their own thing, doing their own pleasure. We're going to deal with that subject. It's, it's here in Colossians. And we have to look at that. And there's many professing Christians, and, and they break the Sabbath day. They haven't got the principle in their mind one day and seven belongs to the Lord. And and they're guilty of doing their own thing. They don't love God the way they ought. And they don't realize they're they're breaking the fourth commandment. When it says remember, it means to call to mind. This was already established in Eden. The fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. It's, It's not just the biological parents, but it means being subject to authority in the home, in the church, in the state. And oh, isn't there great disobedience to parents today? Not honoring them, not respecting them. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Premeditated, cold-blooded murder. Thousands, hundreds of thousands have been murdered. Think of the troubles in the history of Northern Ireland. It'll soon be coming up to the um, 100th anniversary of the Alton of A murders. Six innocent Protestants were murdered. County Down. The Lord knows who they are. The Lord knows those whose hands were stained with blood. Yet the Lord says, Thou shalt not kill. Yet what about abortion, the murder of innocence that we're dealing with today? The seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. The explosion of sexual sins. The eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. 
dealing with all forms of theft. What about the ninth commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Lies. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Where were you, boy? I was caught in traffic. There was an accident down the Newtonards Road or in the Lisburn Road. And the reality is you'd slept in. Just telling the boss, sorry, boss, I slept in. I deserve a rap over the knuckles, but I'm telling you the truth. He'll think more of you by telling him the truth than, than you telling him, oh, I was caught up on traffic, or there was a traffic accident, if there was none. You see, bearing false witness, he even applies to that. Thou shalt not covet. That's how Paul knew that he was a sinner, lost in his heart, lusting after certain things. And we're all guilty. And we're all under that law. And, 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 and we're, we're, we're all um, identified because this law is holy and pure and good and just and true. And the law was designed to show us how sinful we are. That's the identity of the document. Also, I want you to think about the hostility of the document. Notice it says in the text, that was contrary to us, which was against us, which was contrary to us. Can you see that in the text? You see, the law condemns us. The law of God, the moral law, is not our friend. It can't be bent, it can't be broken, it can't be bought, it can't be wearied, it, it doesn't sympathize with us. The, long, the law of God comes alongside you and me. If we're guilty as a lawbreaker, and it pronounces guilty, it's contrary to us. The, the word contrary means adverse. In other words, it stands like an adversary. It's not going to help us. It's not going to show us sympathy. It's not going to stand up for you and say, no, it was only a mistake. We'll plead mitigating circumstances here. No, it's got a duty. And the duty is to cry over every one of us guilty and cries for the death penalty for every one of those laws that we have broken in sin, in thought, in word, and deed. And you see, people imagine, but we're not too bad. And the reality is we're guilty, hell-deserving sinners who have broken the law of God. And the law condemns you and me. The law curses you. The law charges you. Are you aware of it? Is your conscience smitten? Does your conscience highlight your sins, your violations of the law? Remember the woman taken in adultery? They wanted to stone her. The Lord Jesus comes along, John 8. He says, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. What did he do then after he made that utterance? Well, he, he got bent towards the ground, maybe sat, maybe on his knees, and he wrote in the ground. What did he write? Did he write something to do with the moral law of God? I'd like to think that he did. You see, remember, he's the master of the law. And one by one, the Bible tells us from the eldest to the youngest, they were smitten in their conscience. He that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. So one of you that's holy and just and pure and righteous before God, you cast the stone. And there wasn't one of them in that crowd because they all knew they had transgressed the law of God. Whatever he had wrote on the ground, their conscience was smitten. See, God's law is against you. God's law is hostile to you. It's an adversary to you. Remember in Daniel 5, Belshazzar? He was having a party. They were drinking wine and whiskey from the, the vessels from the house of God. A thousand lords there, they were having a great time. And all of a sudden, the finger of a man's hand appeared and wrote on the plaster, Mini, mini, tickle you farson. Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is taken from you. You see, Belshazzar discovered he was liable to punishment. He had been weighed in the balances of God's law and found wanting. The law is against us. The law is contrary to us. It's hostile. See, the law was designed to show us sin. The law was designed to pronounce us guilty. The law curses and condemns us. The law of God is really a rule for life for the believer. You say, it's nothing to me. But that law was repeated at Sinai. 
It was written in the hearts of the people. It was written in tables of stone to show a permanence. And, and when he mentions here handwriting, you've got to think of something that was written down, written by the finger of God. You, you think of not only the writing on the Ten Commandments, but you think of the book of life that's got your name on it, the handwriting of ordinances, every violation of that law from the day you were born to the day you die is in that book. That's what we mean by the documentation of trespasses, the handwriting of ordinances. Now, one other thing very quickly. The disannulment of trespasses. Notice these words as we look again at the text. Blotting out, that has to do with erasing. And then it says, and took it out of the way, that has to do with expelling. And then you've got nailing it to his cross. There's the expiation. Now think of that. Here's the disannulment of trespasses. Trespasses can be erased. He mentions not only are you alive and forgiven, but here's the only ground upon which God pardons all your sin. Your trespasses have been erased, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us. Do you know what that means? Have you heard of the phrase, wiping the slate clean? You see, sin is not only a trespass, but sin is like a debt. And we owe a huge debt. And the debtor could come along and produce the handwriting. Here it is. It's against you. You're, you're subject to this. And you see, in Paul's day, things were written in papyrus. And they used an ink called bulrush ink. It had no acid. And um, when it was left alone and when it was dry, it was there as a record. But if you wanted to, to wipe something away, erase something, you took a sponge with water, you wiped the papyrus slate or reed, and the, the bulrush ink was removed. That's the picture. There's no blot in the book. It's all gone. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Trespasses are not only erased, but they're expelled and took it out of the way. That means removed. All, all offense is gone. Hi. Because one stepped into the midst of our world called Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. And he came to remove sin by dealing with it. That's why Paul could say there in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. He says in Colossians chapter, or Galatians 3 and verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, be made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Taken out of the way. How? Not only erased and expelled, but notice this as we finish. Expiated. Nailing it to his cross. Here's the perfect work substitution. Here's the work of the substitute. Sin, not only the Savior, but sin nailed to the cross, invisible to the eye. If we think of Christ, remember the superinscription, uh, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But there was an invisible inscription on the cross that day. It had to do with our sins and trespasses. See, sin was not brushed aside. It wasn't God coming along and saying, I'll just forgive you, it'll be okay. God didn't turn a blind eye. God didn't bend the law. He didn't say it's not a big deal or, or, or make a big issue. He just didn't say, I forgive you. Could you think of a judge, a criminal in the dock, maybe a murderer? There's stacks of evidence. The man's guilty. The judge pronounces him guilty and then says, you know what, sir, just you go home free. 
The law was not set aside. That, that, that would be a travesty of justice. There would be an uproar. It would be, 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 be a cry of injustice. The law is not set aside. The law is not abolished or removed or disregarded. No, the basis of true forgiveness is found in this. That sin was dealt with in Christ when he was nailed to the cross. It was nailed in his cross. And we can escape the penalty of sin. We can escape the uh, wrath of God. We can escape a, a lawful hell. Because Jesus Christ in his person and work dealt with sin. That's why the Bible says, For he that is God made him, that is Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's why the prophet Isaiah said, Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with the stripes we are healed. You see, the debt was paid. The debt that we owed to the broken law was paid in full. Therefore, we can have a new relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can have fellowship and communion with God through our Lord Jesus. And here's life's greatest blessing. It's wonderful to know your sins have been blotted out. Isn't it wonderful to know they've been taken out of the way? Isn't it wonderful to know they've been nailed to his cross? And there's the marvel of the gospel. The bookkeeper can open the book. The book of life with your name on it. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. They're, they're gone. My sins are gone. They're blotted out. They're not in the book. Because they've been paid for in full. A full, free, forever pardon of every thought, every word, every sinful deed. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Past, present, and future. Here's the true basis upon which forgiveness is found. God has dealt with sin through the blood shedding and the cross work of Christ. And only in this ground can sins be erased, expelled, and expiated. The disannulment of trespasses. Have you ever had a discussion about trespasses? Do you discover the document of trespasses? Do you know anything of the disannulment of trespasses? The Lord bless you today. I trust that you do, and you'll enjoy the reality of this full, free, and forever forgiveness. We're going to sing in closing just a couple of verses. Our time is gone of 302. 302. Let's sing just verses 1 and 2 of 302 and then we'll have the prayer. just bow in prayer. Lord, take these few stumbling, stammering words from this poor preacher today on this very important, this vital subject, the only scriptural basis for the pardoning of sin. Apply it to our hearts and minds. Speak to those, Lord, who are still in their sin, who have never received Christ as Lord and Savior, and bring them to the knowledge that they can have a full, free, and forever pardon 
through the blood of Christ. Purge away their sin, Lord, on the ground of this blood. Part us now in your fear with your favor. Take us to your homes in safety. We pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of thyself, the communion of the Holy Spirit will be upon us, both now and evermore, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you today. Hi there. Thank you for joining with us on another Lord's Day. We really appreciate you giving of your time to tune in and watch our church online experience. We believe that the Lord's Day is a powerful opportunity for us to worship together as one body empowered by the Spirit of God. If you need support or desire help or wish to contact us, please do so via our website. If you want to help us, please like and share this video. For any new broadcasts and videos, don't forget to subscribe to our social media outlets online. Thank you for watching.